It's a great, great honor for me to be here with this uh, genius of skullduggery and erudition and passion and rigor and joy, Lewis Hyde. Such a fabulous writer, it's a great honor, Lewis. And now I'm gonna ruin it all by telling you a story. You ready for a story? Yes. Not easily offended? Yes. Okay. <laughs> they said it. <laughs> So how did we get here in the shape we are tonight? Where do we come from? How was this world made at all, at all, at all? Some will tell you we come from an extraordinary garden. Others will tell you we come from the very center of the earth. But we have traveled here today to tell you a little bit about the true origination of things. And when you've heard this story, you may understand a little bit more about why we're in quite the shape we are today. So a long, long, long time ago, there was nothing but water. There was the earth, but it's covered in water. There are a few animals scudding about. And the one our story really begins with is Wolverine himself. Now Wolverine, you can't go too long in a room without mentioning the beloved of Wolverine. Would you like to know her name? We'll try this again. Would you like to know the name of Wolverine's beloved? Yes. Her name, which is the greatest name in all the mythologies of all the world, is this. One who wriggles nicely. <laughs> That's her name. One that wriggles nicely. And she is the great love story of Wolverine's life to this day, to this hour, to this second. So we have the earth and it's covered in water. But whenever one who wriggles nicely wanted to catch the attention of Wolverine, which was a couple of times a week, she would wave at him in the far distance. And the only way he could get to her was jumping from rock to rock to rock till he got to her little, uh, her little copse where their commingling could begin. But the trouble is the water is still going up. And those desire paths that have lived between them are running into short circuit. I mean, Wolverine is looking around thinking, shit, I'm not gonna be able to get to my beloved soon. So he calls to him his old pal, Otter. And he says, Otter, you can go far, far down underneath the gray waves, far deeper than me. And I've heard a rumor that underneath all of this water, there are trees and there is desert and there is volcanoes, there is tundra snow, there are jaguar teeth down there, there are a thousand interesting things, but I can't personally get to them, but you could. If you could go glug, 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 down to the very bottom and just fill yourself up with all the nature, come back to the surface, spit it out, we could start to build an earth around us and I could get to one who wriggles nicely much more swiftly. And, uh, you know, Otter is thrilled with the task and he says, uh, I shall not fail you. And with that, he disappears. He put up a good show, but after, you know, 50 meters down, he can't take it. He comes back, he's getting the bends back up to the surface. So he's there, you know, he's failed. Now up pops Beaver. And he says, Beaver, this is the, you heard what I said to Otter, go down because I've heard not just Mountains are down there, not just desert is down there, not just tundra is down there, but what is going to become human beings themselves? What is going to become culture down there? If you look down there, you may see Rembrandt scurrying around. You may see, uh, you know, Simone de Beauvoir. There's many interesting things underneath the waves. Can you get them for me? And uh, Beaver giving the cold Yatesian gaze to uh, Otto says, yes, I shall not fail you. Well, of course he goes down and of course he blows it and of course he comes back up. And so they say to themselves, geez, well, we kind of, there's only one animal left. And they go, surely not. Muskrat. Now I've got to tell all you mythologists in the audience that muskrat is one we would call the runt of the litter. There are not high hopes for muskrat. 
But Muskrat says, I shall go down, I shall pull this off. And so, blub, 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 down goes Muskrat. He goes further than Otter. He goes further than Beaver. He goes down to the very bottom of the floor of the sea, and sure enough, all the old legends were true. There were snowy-tipped mountains down there. There were blue-green pines down there. There were meadows filled with wildflowers erupting from the earth like cups of honey. And he fills his little rotund body with it. And he fills it with Jacqueline Dupre. And he fills it with every beautiful, sweet, and interesting, and diabolical and luciferic thing that is to come. And then he bloats his way up bloop, 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 to the surface. You know what Michelin Man looks like? You remember? He's like a little... Uh, <laughs> Muskrat Michelin man. And there he is, but here's the rub. He is constipated by culture. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. It's, it's, a, it's a thing. So they bring him out and they, they look at him and Otter's poking him and, you know, Beaver's poking him and Wolverine's poking at him. And they can see his eyes, his ears, his mouth. Every time you look in, it's filled with rocks and mineral deposits and bits of foliage and there's jungle feathers poking out of his ears. But it's impacted. And they said, well, there's nothing we can do. Until Otter says, you know, <clears throat> Wolverine... There's one orifice we haven't checked yet. And Wolverine says, <laughs> what do you mean? And they said, come on, spin him round. <laughs> Are you up for this muskrat? And he says, he says, yeah, yeah, come on, make it happen. <laughs> so they spin him round. And, and I mean, I, I don't know, Lewis, how long ago you were, the last time you were up close and personal to the derriere of muskrat, but it's quite something. Those two great furry mounds, and sure enough, they part them. They gaze into the scrying bowl of muskrat sphincter. <laughs> they peer in, and sure enough, little bits of foliage are poking out, and there's a little bit of John Coltrane's saxophone <laughs> sticking. And if you, put, if you put your ear to it, you can, you can hear the Beatles tuning up in Liverpool. Many wonderful things that are to come are unfortunately caught in the colon of muskrat. <laughs> So they sit there and they smoke, because of course animals smoke. <laughs> and they say, you know, what, what are we going to do? And Wolverine says, I know what we've got to do. It comes a light time in every Wolverine's life where you have to give muskrats some respect. Just breathe, muskrat, you'll get used to it. Just breathe, breathe out, push out. He opens him up a little bit and he gazes in. And sure enough, you just, just gaze in with me for a moment. <laughs> just gaze in with me deep, deep into the deep ancestral Aboriginal dreaming of muskrat sphincter. And what can you see down there? Is there Patti Smith down there? Is there, is that James Joyce working on Ulysses down there? But anyway, there comes a time in all of our lives where you've just got to get down. Press your lips to the ass of, uh, little muskrat and start to blow. And I tell you, Wolverine blew and he blew and he blew and he blew. And there was an immediate and devastating effect to his blowing. Muskrat's eyes shot open, his mouth shot open, his, his no nostril shot open, even the little tip of his prick shot open and bursting out from it was foliage and there was jungles and there was desert and there was foamy waters and there was the Orkney Islands and there was Iceland and there was Yggdrasil, the world tree and there was Beowulf and on the back of Beowulf there was Rudolf Steiner and a hundred things that are to come were all there. And he blew 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 into his unutterable horror. Wolverine realized he had a job for life. In fact, <laughs> The world as we know it will only continue if Wolverine keeps blowing into the sphincter of muskrat. I have it on good reputation. He did, they do it on shift duty these days. But that's how we came to be in the shape we are tonight. <laughs> Bless you. So is this microphone on? I think so. 
So I've made a horrible mistake. <laughs> I said, oh, you go first. <clears throat> tell, tell us a story, then I'll, you know, I'll have some ideas. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> you can take out your pens now. <laughs> So actually, this book of mine, it, the title keeps getting misstated. People say it's called Trickster Makes the World. But in fact, it's called Trickster Makes This World, because as in this story, uh, this is a mythology about characters who mess things up a bit or are involved with mess. And uh, so, you know, there were other divinities who tried to make a perfect world. And, uh, uh, but the world that you and I live in is the creation of Partly those divinities, but also this other figure who has, who's a bungler, uh, who is not as smart as one might have thought. So <clears throat> I must back off. I <laughs> wish I had a drum. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so the book is about trickster figures. And these are characters found all over the world. Um, uh, Muskrat, well, I don't know who's the trickster in that. Uh, probably Wolverine. And, um, but I'm, a lot of my book is built around Hermes, uh, and particularly the Homeric Hymn to Hermes, an old story. Uh, and Hermes is the, you know, the, the thief and the liar of the Greek system. In North American Indian mythology, there's a coyote figure and the raven, and uh, um, sometimes it's hare. In West Africa, there's Eshu and Legba. These characters come over in the slave trade and appear in Haiti and in some African-American stories. In China, there's the monkey figure. In the Norse mythology, Loki plays this role. So these are characters who break the rules that you and I uh, are so careful to not break. And um, sort of witlessly, <clears throat> in a way, they are described as, as characters who uh, don't know what they're doing. And so uh, are the agents of horrible mistakes and also the agents of quite remarkable discoveries. Uh, they are, on the one hand, uh, create messes. On the other hand, they are, are heroes of culture. A sort of simple way to describe them <clears throat> is that they are the sacred boundary crossers. So you know, all cultures have boundaries that they care about, uh, both internally. We make a whole series of distinctions that help us uh, know how to be in the world night and day, male and female, heaven and hell, private and public. I see there's a private garden in Dartington, and then there's a public garden. So there's a wall. That's uh, a distinction that we make. And, um, and the trickster is the character uh, found at these boundaries or who has the skill to, to penetrate them. And particularly, is called trickster because to the degree that we care about them, we don't want somebody to uh, you know, get into the private garden when there's a public garden. And so it takes a certain kind of cunning or subterfuge to, to do it. We also care that there's a boundary to our group, usually, that, that there are people who are outside of the group and inside of the group. And the trickster is the, is the edge character who's found at the edge of the firelight at night or uh, at the gate of the village or the gate of the city um, and has commerce with these strangers. <clears throat> so, um, and, and sacred boundary crosser, that is, this is not simply um, someone uh, fooling around uh, without any higher purpose, as it were, that, that, that there's something very useful about having this character around. <clears throat> now, one uh, adjustment needs to be made to the idea of the boundary crosser, because in some of the stories, at the beginning of time, <clears throat> the trickster is involved in actually creating a boundary so that later he could become the character who, who uh, uh, disturbs it. Uh, so that, for example, typically, uh, it used to be anciently that humans and the gods sat together at the table and walked together on Earth. And then Trickster comes along and does something so rude and disgusting that the gods uh, leave this Earth. And uh, in, in one African story, the gods just, they go up six or eight feet to kind of get away from the, and, and then, and then uh, um, but Trickster persuades all the women when they're done washing dishes to throw the water up into the air. And it just keeps hitting the gods. So they end up going way up into heaven. Uh, after which, uh, this is uh, in the Eshu and Legba stories, after which Eshu becomes the character who's able to do, 
to move back and forth between heaven and earth and is the diviner, is the one who's able to tell human beings on earth what the, what the pattern is in heaven and, and bring messages. Though it's, uh, it's the case that uh, he's not a trustworthy diviner. So um, uh, in, in addition, and Hermes is the same way. Hermes, Hermes is the messenger of the gods. But, but these, because they are ambiguous figures, they bring messages to you which you can't understand or which you misinterpret. So uh, again, they become the boundary crosser uh, once the boundary has been made. Um, so anyway, I want to, I'm going to offer one set of ideas about these characters tonight, but <clears throat> to do so, let me begin with uh, two or three sample stories. Um, I mean, in the Wolverine story that we just heard, the, you know, the scatological element of that belongs to this figure uh, and, and, and belongs to the distinction we make between uh, purity and, and dirt. And um, so, you know, somehow in that story, it matters that, uh, that you have a relationship to the anus before you can create the world, uh, which is not the way some of the other divinities think. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, so somehow the, you know, um, interrogating your impulse toward purity uh, turns out to be useful if you're going to create a universe. Um, so one of these old stories out of the Greek system, this is in Hesiod uh, about Prometheus. And Prometheus apparently, uh, in, that, in this version, creates the human race out of clay. And, um, and the human race uh, lives a long time and uh, dies in ease. Uh, but Prometheus has a kind of ambitions for the race and would like them to become immortal. And so he works out a uh, sort of game with the gods to try to get, uh, in a sense, the portion of, uh, of the universal agency uh, rearranged such that humans could be immortal. And to do this, um, he kills and sacrifices an ox. And then he divides the sacrificial ox into portions. And he's going to try to trick Zeus into taking the portion that has to do with mortality. So one portion has the bones, and he makes them try. He tries to make them look attractive by putting fat on them. And the other portion has the meat, which could feed you. And he tries to make it look un unattractive by putting the ox uh, stomach on top of the meat. And um, uh, he does this partly because Zeus is going to have get first choice, and he's trying to get Zeus to make the wrong choice and choose the meat. Um, but Zeus, it turns out, is a better reader. Uh, he's a better interpreter of symbols than poor Prometheus. And so Zeus, Zeus uh, well, here's Hesiod. He says, Zeus saw the trick uh, and in his heart thought mischief against mortal men. With both hands he took up the white fat. So Zeus chooses the bones and the fat. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about this in a minute. But, but um, interestingly, Hesiod having said that, adds one detail, which is he says this uh, is the beginning of the art of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the Greek system, the Greeks, when they slaughtered an animal, would sacrifice to the gods. And what they sacrificed was the bones and the fat. They would put them on the sacrificial fire. And humankind, the people in the town and the city, would eat the meat and, and, the, and the stomach. And, um, but. Uh, you know, part of the argument about trickster figures is that they are bunglers, but also inventive. And you can kind of see this in a way Prometheus isn't smart enough to fool Zeus. So he's made a trick that doesn't quite work. At the same time, out of it comes uh, an, the art of sacrifice, something that becomes an element in culture. Uh, and this is an origin story for the art of sacrifice. Um, so you know, out of this uh, messed up trick, a lot of things follow. Uh, Zeus is angry about this. He hides fire so that humankind doesn't have fire. Then uh, Prometheus has to steal fire. Uh, and sadly, humankind from then on uh, doesn't live very long and dies in pain. So we have a lot to, Trickster has a lot to answer for. Um, so to back up, again, the, the, the two portions here, uh, the, 
you know, the bones are the part of the body that doesn't decay. Uh, when the Greeks cremated a body, the bones were the thing that, that, they, that they kept out. Uh, the, the, the stomach and the meat, this becomes the human portion. And symbolically in the Greek system, uh, it's, it's not only our portion, we are like that. Humankind, we are, we are meat sacks who have to eat constantly, uh, trying to put off the end. Uh, so, you know, we are subject to the shameless, needy, greedy fact of appetite uh, that r rules us all our days. So another way to say what Prometheus does in this story is um, when the Greeks sacrificed an animal, the way that they divided the animal up was a map of how you could imagine the spiritual world and the social world. So in this case, you see that the, the portion that's the bones and the fat is the portion that belongs to the gods. And the other portion is the portion that belonged to humans. And even the division of meat after that, if you know the good piece of meat was given to the big guy in town and the crummy piece of meat would be given to a slave or a servant. Or so, so, so that the apportioning of the sacrifice is a map of, of, these, of the spiritual world and the, and the social world. Um, and in a sense, reinforces it. So uh, another way to say then about what Prometheus is trying to do is to reapportion the world. He's trying to change the system by changing the sacrificial portions. Um, OK, so I'm going to come back to this in a minute. But I now want to lay in a, a story from a different system that helps me expand upon what's going on in this story. So and this is two little stories out of, the, out of the Norse mythology. One of them is about, well, they're both about Loki. Uh, in one of them, Loki, he, he, so in the, in the Norse system, the gods are Asir, and they live in this walled heaven called Asgard. And in the heaven is an orchard where grow the apples of immortality. And they're guarded by a woman named Idun. And, um, the apples are what the gods eat to keep themselves forever young. And uh, I think the giants at one point persuade Loki to try to uh, upset this system. So Loki goes to Idun and says, you know, those apples of immortality are quite wonderful. But in fact, outside of Asgard, there are some other apples which are maybe even better. You should come and compare them. So she says, OK. So she takes some apples, and she leaves Asgard to compare them to other apples. And this is a good way to destroy your fantasy about the eternal truth. Um, uh, comparison. Uh, you can try this at home. Uh, think about your loved one and compare that person to somebody else. And you'll begin to see that it erodes your idealization, that the, the other person you're thinking of is maybe a little more well-spoken, maybe a little more handsome or pretty. Soon you're not sure, sure of the ideal you had to begin with. What happens in this case is that once the apples are outside, the gods begin to grow old and gray. And they have a panic attack, as we all do when we grow old and gray. And, uh, and they figure out what's happened. And they go after Loki. And they say, you know, this is a disaster. And Loki, at that point, says, well, OK, let's bring the apples back. And he does. And the wall is closed again. And the gods are happy again. And in a way, it, 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 it's sort of a harmless Loki in that story and in other stories is a mischief maker. That is, nothing serious and destructive happens. Um, uh, he just changes the system a little, and then it goes back to the. But it does show that Loki is uh, a potential agent of change. It shows that uh, time can infect eternity, that uh, uh, the temporal world where things are subject to change uh, can actually get into Asgard in some way. And the things that we thought could never change uh, begin to change. So the second story about Loki is one in which is, it's actually an unusual story in the trickster set. But uh, it's one where you see this problem of change uh, more gravely. And that is the story about the death of Balder. So Balder was one of these characters. Uh, and he's, he's handsome and bright and young, and this is associated with the sun. And um, he begins to have disturbing dreams. Something's going to happen to him. He's worried about he's going to get hurt, or maybe he's going to die. 
And he goes to his mother, Frigg, and he says, you know, I'm having these upsetting nightmares. Every night I'm, something horrible is going to happen. So Frigg, um, like all mothers, she sets out to protect her son from all harm. And what she does is to go through the world and ask everything in the world to make an oath to not harm Boulder. So she goes to stones and to water and to you know, paving stones and the oriental rugs and the aluminum chairs and the, and the lighting, so everything. She asks everything not to harm Boulder. And everything in the world takes, everything in heaven and earth takes an oath not to harm this boy. And um, then what happens is uh, the gods find out about this and they're amused and they begin to uh, enjoy themselves by throwing things at Boulder. <laughs> so he's standing there and they throw rocks at him and they fall away and they throw arrows at him and they fall away and they so this is you know a game of a midsummer's evening is to throw things at boulder and um but this kind of perfection this level of perfection irritates the trickster figure uh so loki kind of sees this and he says eh, let's see if this is really true so he disguises himself as a woman and he hangs around Questioning, and finally he ends up chatting with Frigg, and he says, well, you know, how's this work? And she says, oh, I went all around to ask everything in heaven and earth, and so forth. He says, everything? She says, well, yeah, every well, she says, actually, you know, I didn't ask the mistletoe. It seemed so young and harmless. <laughs> 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 so then Loki knows what to do, so he goes and he finds the mistletoe, and he makes a little dart out of it. And then he comes to where the gods are throwing things at Baldur, and there's one god named Hod, who's blind, and he's not doing anything. And so Loki says, how come you're not throwing anything at Balder? <laughs> he says, well, I'm blind. What do you think? So Loki says, well, here, take this little dart. I'll, I'll help you. I'll guide your hands. So Hud throws the missile to the dart, and it kills Balder. You know, often in the, in the trickster stories, uh, there's the first death. I mean, this is the first death of, amongst these Asir. And, um, and the gods are incredibly ticked off at Loki for this ruining this whole system. So uh, they track him down and they punish him. They tie him beneath a mountain using the guts of his children. That's how you have to tie up a trickster. And um, uh, he's still under there. Uh, uh, his wife is able, oh yeah, there's a serpent dripping poisonous fluid on his face. And his wife stands there with a cup and keeps it from hurting him. But every so often, she has to take and dump it out. And, and then we have earthquakes, because uh, Loki has to, at any rate. Um, so in the, in the Norse stories, uh, that story about the death of Baldur, it doesn't say that it leads to. But in fact, the sequence is always what happens next is Ragnarok, is the death of the gods, is the end of the world. And so the implication is, if you really do t tie up this character, that'll destroy your world. So they, they bind Loki. At, at that point, it begins the death of the, of the gods and, and the death of the world. I mean, everything falls apart. Brother fights brother. Uh, one wolf eats the sun, and another wolf eats the moon. And there's an endless winter or an endless summer. And uh, you know the English Channel has risen so that no immigrants from Syria can get in. And, uh, you know, everything falls apart, and the gods are destroyed, including Loki. Though in the prophecies about this, the prophecy ends finally saying, but after that, uh, the daughter of the sun will come back as a new sun, and the moon will reappear, and there will be two humans who survive and repeople uh, re the earth, and the world will come back green again. So... Grim stuff. <laughs> so I want to say something about the mistletoe. So how to read this odd little dart. And to do it, I'm going to just lay in quickly uh, a related story. You know, people who do comparative religion and comparative mythology I always like to find, oh, this story is related to that story. Maybe there's an Indo-European root. And they, so <laughs> they find another story that's told in, in southern Russia. Um, where there's another trickster figure named Sirdon, and there's another kind of uh, handsome, young, shining character associated with the sun named Soslan. Uh, 
the, the detail in this is that Soslan is, is again uh, uh, invulnerable, except he has a weak place in his knee joints. In the knee is where he has the one, it's like the Achilles heel, only it's the Soslan knee. <laughs> <clears throat> And I'm sure there's somebody in this room who has trouble with their knees. This is a, <clears throat> the knee joint can go out on you. At any rate, it's the same story uh, that there's a kind of game of throwing things at Soslan uh, um, because he's invulnerable. But Sirdan figures out the, about this thing about the knee. And they throw this toothed wheel at this character. And they finally hit him in the knee joint, and it kills him. So I'm going to come back to the mistletoe with this. but but the the abstraction that I take out of these two stories is if you want to kill a god or get rid of an ideal, go for the joints. Attack them at the joints. So in the, in the Sirdan and Soslan story, there's an actual sort of literalized joint in the, in the human body. But the mistletoe story, the, the Loki story, has joints in it too. And here the, here's how you see them. First of all, Frigg is... Um, uh, goes around and asks everything in heaven and earth not to hurt Balder. Well, that's one of these distinctions that we make, one of these dichotomies, one of these divisions. There's heaven and there's earth. The mistletoe is in neither category. You know, this is a plant, a parasitic plant that's up in the trees. So it's not here on the ground, it's not up in heaven. It's, it's like a boundary marker between these two worlds. And so it somehow eludes the categories which are so carefully set up. That you ask everything in heaven and earth, but you miss this thing in between. The other thing about the mistletoe is that anciently, in northern countries, there were uh, Midsummer Eve celebrations. And this was the time for collecting mistletoe. And so the Midsummer Eve is the time of the solstice, the time uh, uh, when the sun reverses its passage. So all spring long and in the beginning of summer, the sun is getting higher and higher. And then it turns around and begins to go down. Uh, th these are called the tropics, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And, and the tropic is, um, uh, it, it means the turning. It's the place where the thing turns. And so um, uh, the, the, the summer solstice, it, it's a nick in time. It's a place where the solar year is articulated where you can see a division point. And the mistletoe is associated with this turning point. So these are the, the, the place between heaven and earth and the place where the sun has to turn around and go in the other way. These are like the joints of the solar system. And they are associated with Balder. They're the place where you can attack this guy. Um, though it should then be said that the, the mistletoe is not simply deadly, because this is the plant that, that stays green all year long. Uh, in, in the winter, the mistletoe is still green. So anciently, or long ago, Sir James Fraser you know, argued that this, this is why the mistletoe becomes the symbol for the idea that the soul can survive the death of the body. It's a thing that, that doesn't have the same uh, um, winter death that, that other things do. So in that sense, the mistletoe is ambiguously lethal. Uh, as in the old prophecy, the world ends, but then the world comes back. These, these are stories for a, uh, a northern agricultural world in which the sun actually does disappear, but the sun does return. So the mistletoe is, it kills, but it also has in it the promise of the world coming back. OK. So the project, my project in both of the books that are here um, is to think about artistic practice, to think about creativity, and how we imagine the imagination. And um, so I have an early book about gift exchange as a kind of way to think about the commerce of the creative spirit. But this trickster book is about sort of disruptive imagination, about uh, these characters who, who break the rules and somehow are nonetheless creative. And so out of these stories, I'm going to offer an image of art making. And um, it, it's connected to this idea of joints. <clears throat> because our word art um, is connected to a whole set of words that have this AR root in the Indo-European language system. And the AR, the R root, 
originally meant uh, to make a joint or to make something or to craft something. Uh, and we still have it, you know, there are a lot of words that have this built into it. So that uh, if you're an arthropod, you know, you're an animal that has jointed legs. If you have arthritis, you're a person who has uh, inflammation in your joints. Uh, if you're an architect or an artisan, these are joiners of, of one kind or another. Um, the other word that comes out of this system is the word articulate. Uh, and um, mm. it, it, you know, we use it mostly now to talk about somebody who's well-spoken. That's an articulate person. But uh, to articulate also means to, uh, um, to joint something. So you articulate a skeleton, or the, the elbow is a joint that's articulated on the pr principle of the uh, hinge. So to articulate is to, is to joint something. And actually, in language as well, uh, to be articulate is to be able to make clear the joints of your thought and the joints of your speech. There's a wonderful remark in Aristotle that uses this image and word. Aristotle says, the dolphin, the dolphin makes a squeak and moans when it is out of the water and exposed to the air. This animal possesses a voice since it has both lungs and windpipe, but as its tongue cannot move freely and it, as it has no lips, it has no articulation of the voice. <laughs> if I just go like this, you cannot understand what I'm saying. I have to articulate the flow of sound with my tongue and my lips. This is the joint work in the flow of sound. And it's also the joint work in, in, in written language or in spoken language. You know, there are little, the articles, the articles are little words that, you know, and and button the and a, these are the little words that sort of set off things. Uh, or actually, the, even the word article is, is a short piece that, you know, divide, to divide language into letters and syllables and words and sentences and paragraphs and chapters, this is the articulation of thought. This is how you show the structure of your idea flow and um, make it available for other people. So, you know, where I'm headed is to say that um, there's a kind of artistic practice, which is the practice of working with joints. Okay. And um, uh, the usual kind of this is um, to make things that are well jointed. Uh, in fact, our word harmony is an, another comes from the same AR root. It's an aspirated AR harmony, and and so mostly what you want, and most people who are artistic practitioners are involved in making joints that hold together, that are stiff and firm. If you're an architect, you don't want your building to fall down and have joints that come apart. Um, you know, Dartington Hall has lasted a long time because it is a well jointed building, and. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the dominant practice of artistic work is to uh, make things where the joints are, are firm and, and well disposed in space and time and so forth. So then the minority position is this trickster figure who comes along and says, well, that's all very well, but uh, there's something else that needs to have happen here. Um, in fact, um, one thing to say about uh, tricksters is that in, in, in these old stories about polytheistic worlds in which several gods are slowly uh, come into being, the trickster is usually the last born. In the, in the Greek system, there are 12 gods, and Hermes is the last born. And it's because what you need before you can be the sacred boundary crosser, you need some boundaries. Again, so you have Apollo and Zeus and Hera and Aphrodite and so forth. All of these are like gods who have ego positions. They have a, a, a situation they care about, and they uh, want to guard that situation. Like, like Hades is in charge of the underworld, and he cares that the underworld have a, has a boundary and that the dead cannot come back into this world. Uh, that's why when Persephone is trapped in the underworld, it takes Hermes to go down and get her back up. Uh, Hermes is the one character who can break this boundary. But, but basically, everybody cares about uh, their system. And uh, at, but once you have an organized cosmos, the problem is that it's going to grow stale on you. Mm -hmm. That it's going to that the that the uh, the boundaries are going to solidify. The walls are going to get thick. Um, everything is going to calcify. Uh, the the ego is going to really care about its position. 
And, um, and particularly if the world changes, which it does seem to do, uh, the system that's in place may not fit the thousand years later, and you may need to change the system. So uh, this character is there to make sure that the world is flexible, uh, and the culture itself is flexible, uh, such that it doesn't become you know, like a bureaucracy that, ha that had a function 50 years ago but doesn't anymore, and, and, uh, and people are hungry. So, so the trickster comes along as the joint worker and um, in three different ways. One is we've already seen. Um, it's not usual, but, but uh, sometimes the trickster is the character who goes for the joints of the world so aggressively that the world comes apart and, uh, and you get the death of the gods. Uh, so that's one case. It's the minority case. More often what the trickster does is to uh, re-articulate the world. That is to say, uh, you, have, you have a system set up where you have all these divisions that you care about, and the trickster is the character who, who will change the boundaries, who will move the boundary markers. And um, in a way, that story about Prometheus is a story about somebody trying to change the way the gods and the human world are, is articulated in regard to one another. Um, so that's a second kind of joint work that um, that tricksters can do is to rearticulate. Um, and the third uh, is is even milder. Sometimes this character is there simply uh, to make the joints limber, to uh, to, to make the membranes permeable, uh, to uh, bring humor to the system. And um, like, like the story about Loki stealing the apples from Asgard and then returning them, all, all that Loki does is to show that the wall around Asgard can be breached. It doesn't change the world. It doesn't change anything. It just uh, it keeps the gods lively. They have to be on their toes because this could happen. Um, so it's a, it's a permeable membrane. So, so they end up being sort of connectors, not connectors. That is, characters who can make a distinction, who can get across and connect two worlds, but at the same time leave the boundary there if they're simply this, these playful tricksters. Now, I have three examples of actually art, artists working on this. Should I give them, or should we talk a little bit? Or what do I, should I do now? Ask a question. You got a question? Yeah, let's have some questions, and then I'll go back to this, because it... I've been talking a lot. So the system is changing right now. I'm thinking in terms of an economic future, we've got a situation of people who are Is there a role for a trickster in helping us shift shift system? So what do you think is wrong with the system? <laughs> um, well, I mean, obviously, yes. I mean, you know, if the system is not working, then uh, you do need somebody who has the intelligence to rearticulate it. Um, and then there's a puzzle about how to do it correctly. Uh, I mean, in a way, this book of mine about the gift, uh, you, you know, the argument of the gift book is to go back to the old cultures where a lot of commerce was gift exchange and to say that, um, Maybe this, what happens when you have a gift exchange culture, uh, certain things, certain consequences follow from that. And maybe it's useful to talk about the practice of art in that way. In a way, what I was trying to do was to say, these are two different categories, gift and commodity. And you've made a mistake if you think that your art practice belongs in the commodity world. It belongs in this other world. So in a certain sense, the project of that book is to take an is to enter into uh, a different way to imagine the economy and to say there are different economies. And, and it's useful to figure this out and then to begin to decide uh, not only which one you belong to, but also how to have a relationship between them. Uh, so that um, you know, if you try to live in this world today, if you try to live entirely by your gifts, it's very difficult. Uh, so you need to have some contact with the commercial world. If you're entirely in the commercial world, you may just go dead. So you need to have, so yes. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to say. Let's try another question and see if we can build on this. Who else has a question or a remark? Yes. There's a, uh, an underlying thing that I think I'm hearing about being 
fundamentally benign, this trips the role. And one of the first things that I think about when we think about the economy question is what about people like the Mexican cartel? They're not playing by the rules, right. and they're not benign. Right. What do you have to say about that? And they're not playing by the rules, and they're not benign. Um, yeah, well, let, let, let me give you one. You know, so, so occasionally, uh, this kind of intelligence uh, is destructive. And, but I'll give you the example that's in the book. I, I have a chapter. First, I, I, I take the Homeric hymn to Hermes, and I explain that actually one way to read that story is that Hermes is born as a kind of outsider. It's not clear what his status is. And he wants to be an insider. He wants to be part of the Olympic system. And um, the sort of hinge between my two books is the moment when Hermes has gone out and stolen the palace cattle and slaughtered some of them. He he's a one-day-old baby. He comes home, and his mother says, you know, you're a bad kid. You shouldn't do this. And you wear the cloak of shamelessness. And then he says, if my, mother, if my father, Zeus, will not give me offices in, uh, in heaven, I'm going to steal them. Um, so in a way, it, it, it speaks to one of the limitations of gift exchange, which is to say, if you are not in the group gift system, if you're an outsider, it may not work for you. And, and, and what does the outsider do? So after having sort of explained the way Hermes works, I have a chapter about Frederick Douglass, who was an American slave, born in Eastern Maryland as a slave. And, and Douglass's trajectory is, in a way, the same as Hermes's. He, I take him to be a boundary crosser mm. who has the intelligence to try to destroy something. And, and he's a thief to begin with <clears throat> in two ways. One is he steals literacy. The slaves were not <clears throat> allowed to learn to read and write, and Douglas does. And not only does he learn to read and write, but he finds literature that helps him understand his situation. He finds a book called The Columbian Orator, which has in it a, an argument between an abolitionist and a slaveholder. It's a revelation to Frederick Douglass. He says, wow, you know, there's a whole way to argue that the, the, the whole life I've been leading is, is an abomination. And then he steals himself. Uh, you know, to, to be a runaway slave, is to be a free slave is this contradiction. And then he writes a book called The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. And the way that book is set up it begins by explaining how plantation culture works. He says, in, in when I grew up, slaves didn't know when they were born. I don't know when I was born. White people know when they're born. Slaves don't know how to read and write. White people know how to read and write. He goes this whole, you know, there's black and white. I think my father was white and my mother was black, but I'm black. He goes through this whole list of the dichotomies, the, 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 the distinctions that organize plantation culture, and he sets out to destroy them. And in a simple way, <clears throat> simply to write the book is to throw the dart. I mean, the book is the trickster. The book is the thing that enters into the uh, system of discourse and renders plantation culture senseless. Uh, so, um, OK. But in a way, you know, Douglas has something in mind. Uh, by the end of this story, uh, we've had a civil war. The North has won. The Constitution has been changed, slaves are free, and Douglas works in the federal government. So you know, you know, this, this is destructive, but it has a higher purpose. Um, you know, I mean, what can you say about the, the drug cartels? These, these, are, these are not the sacred tricksters. <laughs> these are, you know, there's no, uh, there's no playfulness. Uh, there's no. Um, you know, rejuvenation of the world. It just doesn't fit the story. Um, I mean, I was asked this question yesterday about how do we distinguish between these trickster figures and terrorism. I mean, it's easy. If, if the ground is littered with bodies, you're not in that trickster story. <laughs> you're in some other story. Um, and to my mind, actually, the, one of the real marks of it is, is the humor thing. Um, you know, the Homeric hymn to Hermes, in it, uh, Hermes gets Apollo to laugh. He gets Zeus to laugh. You know, his antics are funny. And uh, you know, one thing I, you could see when Martin told the Wolverine story is you know, it's a funny story. So uh, you know, if you have people who are boundary crosses, but it's deadly serious, that's just not the same. You're not in the same narrative. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I'm just wondering if you could comment on innocence and naivete and 
like how that figures in the archetype of the trickster. Yeah. And um, yeah, and and also like maybe we could distinguish naivete from innocence. I see innocence as a kind of childlike purity quality, and then naivete it's kind of like it's got more of a stupidity tinge. Yes. And I'm, but I'm in, and I'm interested in how those qualities are part of the trickster and yeah. that plays itself out. Yeah. So. You know, in a way, you know, what I do in the book is have a lot of different trickster stories from different cultures, and they actually are really need to be set in the culture they came from. So, in the Hermes story, he's not naive; he has he has something in mind, and it's quite cunning. But um, you make me think of the Native American stories, uh, the the coyote figure, and others in the Native American system. They seem like children in in the sense that they wander around aimlessly; they don't quite know what they're doing, um, but out of this aimlessness comes, um, uh, you know, things begin to happen that are both good and bad. Uh, actually, the way I set it up is um, the one, one definition of some of the trickster figures is that they're ridden by their appetites. Uh, that what drives them is uh, they have sexual appetite and, and they're hungry, hungry all the time. Uh, but the problem is that um, they are also vulnerable to being eaten. And so there has to be a kind of intelligence about how to not get eaten even as you're trying to feed yourself. Uh, so I claim that there's a kind of origin myth about intelligence because you have to figure out the predator who's after you has a certain intelligence and you have to be smarter than that predator. So the story often begins with a naive or, or an innocent character who then has trouble. Uh, things go wrong. But from the thing going wrong, they learn a little bit. And so you can see it becomes a story about the incremental gaining of intelligence. And I think you're right about naivete. So, so it might be this is somebody who never wises up. Um, you, you can sometimes do this with, with um, in the modern world, sometimes the trickster figure seems like the confidence man. And the confidence man is the character who comes along and tries to get you to believe a story which turns out not to be true. Though actually, it's interesting to define the con man as not necessarily a crook. It's somebody in the business of creating belief. And sometimes it turns out the belief is something you should believe in. And sometimes it's something you shouldn't believe in. And your problem is how to know the difference. And so uh, if you shouldn't believe in it and you did, then you're asked to figure out what mistake you made. So you have to wise up. Mm. So uh, the confidence game, in a way, is a schooling in intelligence about how to read the world uh, and how to, how to hear a story for what it's really telling you. Mm. Um, so on the one hand, the trickster stories seem to present a character who's innocent and witless. <clears throat> but they also seem to be a schooling. Uh, out of the witlessness comes the pressure to become intelligent. Uh, so both things are present. OK. I've got a story about that. All right. OK, so you remember Wolverine? <laughs> Do you remember Wolverine? Yes. OK, so listen. Wolverine, we know he doesn't like to be parted from one who wriggles nicely, does he? Does he? Does it kill him? Is it heartbreaking? Yeah. Yes, it is. But occasionally, she says, Right pulse of my whole understanding. Sky boy, will you go out and do a little hunting? So Wolverine is out there hunting. Now, you know, I should start with whenever Wolverine is away from uh, one who wriggles nicely, two things happen to him. One is he starts to weep with grief at her departure. But secondly, he starts to compulsively masturbate with the thought of her. And in fact, snow is a combination of the tears and cum of Wolverine. <laughs> I just want to put that out there right now. So Wolverine <laughs> is... <laughs> Seth. So disgusting. Lean back. So Wolverine is wandering about frantically. You know, he's hunting, he's masturbating, he's weeping. It's all happening at once. But he gets lucky, and he, he gets a couple of ducks. So he's going to cook the ducks, but he knows that, you know, winter is coming, and there are other animals out there that are going to want his ducks. So he... You know who he addresses? He addresses his arsehole. And he says, arsehole, you will do sentry duty while I'm asleep. <laughs> while I am asleep, 
uh, and I want to wake to the scent of roasted duck, you will stay awake. And if anybody comes to nick the ducks, you will release, you know, flatulent gas and great sound that will wake me up. Do we have an accord? And little sphincter said, yes, master, I love you so much, I love you so much. And so with that, Wolverine goes to sleep, dreaming of the duck meal he's going to have. Well, of course, within a minute, a fox comes along, and that little sphincter is... Sf 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 but nothing much. He takes the, fo he takes the uh, ducks from the fire, you know, the spit falls into the flames, and he's gone. 10, 15 minutes pass. Wolverine wakes from his power nap. Does he wake to the scent of roasting duck? No. <laughs> no, he does not. <laughs> he wakes to nothing at all but his food, which has been taken. He sees the fire and he sees the embers, those sharp embers and those sticks in the fire. And he looks down and he says, you asshole. <laughs> you asshole. There was this one thing you had to achieve and you couldn't even do that. And before he thought too much about it, Lewis, he reached into the fire, he grabbed the sharpest stick he could, the hottest stick he could, and he shoved it up his own ass! <laughs> it only took a second for him to realize the enormity of his mistake. <laughs> Friends, in those days, there was no rescue remedy to take you through a moment like this. There was no echinacea for 100,000 miles. Just you and the red-hot poker self-inflicted up your own sphincter. Now, this is actually how the asshole came to look the way it does. This is exactly yes. right. And, and so Trickster made the human body the way it is. In the, in the Winnebago story, the Trickster is born with a penis that wraps entirely around his body which is a problem. And, uh, <laughs> but at a certain point, he gets mad at some animals who are in a hollow log, and he sticks his penis all the way down the log, yeah. and the chipmunks eat it. Yeah. And, and that's why we have an appropriately sized penis now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that vignette. Thank you. Staying with the story, because it's not quite done. <laughs> There's more to come. So here he is. Winter is coming in now with his, his absolutely, uh, his, his, extremely discombobulated backside, and he's dragging it around, you know, like dogs do on the, on the floor. And, uh, but snow is coming, and he's looking around, and he's got to eat something. But time is passing, and there's, there's no food about, there's no other animals moving around. And the snow is coming so thick and so fast that he begins to lose his bearings a little. He's not quite sure which direction he's heading in, but to his delight, uh, after a day or so, he comes across, absolutely definitely, there's a piece of meat on the ground, and he looks at it and he sniffs it. <laughs> he eats it. It's fabulous. It tastes a little like bacon. It's good. And he says to himself, he says, wise and magnificent wolverine, only you are the alpha hunter that can find meat when all the other stupid animals leave it for someone like me to come across clever wolverine and he pads along in the snow a little further and sure enough another 15 minutes later there's another little bit of this delicious crispy meat and he eats it and he carries on and he carries on all winter long he is sustained by these little parcels of crispy meat spring comes the world starts to change everything starts to melt and he begins to realize that he recognizes where he is in fact he realizes he has been moving in circles all winter. And it is only then he realizes the nature of those meats he has been consuming. They are, in fact, of course, the rotting scabs from his own damaged ass. <laughs> so, friends, I have a question for you. <laughs> When was the last time you were such an asshole? it kept you alive all winter long? <laughs> <laughs> you 
You know, the humor is key to this. <laughs> And you know, what is the humor? I mean, it's the juxtaposition of these things that normally don't belong together. <laughs> um, and the tales themselves, therefore, are the trickster element, uh, that they enter the mind as a kind of boundary phenomena, uh, that the mind becomes amused to have this stuff happen. In, in your years of writing the book, which I know was considerable, how did trickster show up around you was there did you did you notice a certain uh certain uh relations in your own life <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> you know at the beginning of the book i have this thing about um i think i think somebody who's really possessed of the trickster spirit doesn't actually write a book <laughs> no. and there's a wonderful line in Italo calvino has a book called Memos from uh, Six Millennia or something like this. But it, he says that, that um, he himself imagines himself as, as a Saturn-like figure dreaming of Hermes. And yeah. that's the way I think of myself. It's more, I am not, I mean, I think I, you know, I, I amused myself. It was fun to be in the realm of these stories. But uh, I was a Saturn dreaming of Hermes, not... Yeah. Uh, I'm not as mischievous as the... And I never got into the kind of trouble you've just described. <laughs> Life can be long. <laughs> yes, right, it's ahead of me. Yeah. So... Hmm. Hmm. You know, in a way, um, you know, there's a serious element to my book because uh, I'm interested in... Uh, some artists who work with this material in a useful way, and they are not necessarily naughty people. I mean, I'll give you an example, which is, um, again, the, the, the trickster figure is shameless. And uh, one of the ways that any culture organizes itself is to have certain shame barriers. They're things that you should be ashamed of, and you're taught this as a child, and sometimes you know it instinctually, um, and, and you need this. No, you know, no group can work very well unless people have a sense of what you should and shouldn't do and where you should stop because you would be ashamed to do that thing. So then in the stories, in a way, you get to enter the fantasy world in which something shameless happens. And you get to kind of try it out and see uh, you know, what, it, what it does imaginatively. Um, again, in the Hermes story, he steals the cattle of Apollo, and his mother says, you're a shameless kid. And, and he is. He's not constrained by the sense that you shouldn't be a thief. Um, so, so then you, you can think about certain artists whose practice is to move the shame barriers. And um, I mean, for example, in the United States, a wonderful writer is Maxine Hong Kingston. And Kingston was... Uh, born in California, but her parents were Chinese immigrants. So they had come from a village in China, and Kingston is born in Stockton, California. And she, therefore, is between two worlds. And her mother, has, her mother is trying to recreate the Chinese village in Kingston's home. And so her mother gives her strict instructions, particularly around sexuality. And, uh, and her mother tells her stories. And the, one of the stories begins, now, you must never tell this story to anybody else. And it's about how to behave as a woman. And um, Kingston's first book begins with that sentence of her mother's. Mother told me never to tell this. And then she tells the story. <laughs> so um, what the mother is doing is laying down a shame, a shame threshold and saying, that, you, you know, you don't tell this story. Here's how you're supposed to behave, and you don't behave this other way. And Kingston's problem is she's now in high school in, in Stockton, California, and, and sexuality is different in the United States than it was in the Chinese village. And so uh, her task is to reimagine uh, the erotic world such that she can grow up and be an American woman. And, and the book is kind of a narrative about this. One thing to say about it is that uh, it has a destructive element. Uh, that is to say, uh, the, she feels the inhibition. She shouldn't tell this story. She's betraying her parents. She's going to destroy something that's valuable. Uh, she makes that very clear. Um, but then she sort of makes an ethical demand on herself, which is to say, uh, if I'm going to write this book, I have to make something beautiful that replaces the thing I'm destroying. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a book that went through seven different drafts, apparently, 
you know, to try to make a story which uh, isn't simply shameless, but just moves the boundaries of shame. So for me, that's, you know, it's not a funny story like Wolverine, but it is a story, you know, human beings actually are none of these archetypal figures. The archetypes are abstractions. And if you meet somebody who says, you know, I am the god of war, or I am the earth mother, you should run away because this is a crazy person. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, human beings, you know, there's a touch of each of these powers in our minds, and, and the, the stories are useful to wake these parts of the human mind. But um, so it's not when I talk about different artists, I'm not saying they are tricksters. What I'm saying is that the trickster mythology is like a map to a certain part of the mind, which then you can use to see uh, fragments, you know, things that, that are of interest in practitioners of actual human beings. Um, so this is an example of the trickster is a shameless character throughout. But you can see in some artists uh, that, that sometimes the artistic project is to bring speech where there was silence, is to bring speech to the thing that you were too ashamed to talk about before. And uh, that turns out to be very useful as cultures change and grow. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> so this is the Trump question. I get this every time now <laughs> since November. So uh, it's, at first glance, it seems maybe he belongs here. Because, yeah, I think that the trickster story illuminates certain things. This is a shameless man. He's ridden by some of his appetites. He's witless, uh, you know, impulsive. Um, so, you know, the, uh, Paul Radin, who wrote a wonderful, did the, collected the Winnebago trickster story and, and wrote a wonderful introduction to it. He says, the trickster does good and evil without knowing the difference. Uh, and and it's, it's not, this is not a psychopath or a, a drug lord. This is just an, an, an aimless, stupid person. And uh, so there's a touch of this in Mr. Trump, yes. Um, a couple of things, I mean, I've been thinking about this. So, First of all, there is no humor in that man. Uh, you know, it, it, there's no playfulness. Uh, it's cruel. Um, and, but the thing that I've been puzzling over and, and haven't really worked out, because I've just been thinking about it this, this week, um, I mentioned that sometimes the trickster figure establishes a boundary, like the division between heaven and earth, so as then to become the boundary crosser. So I'm in, interested to think, you know, Mr. Trump says he's going to build a wall between Mexico and the United States. It's nuts. He's not going to build this wall. But um, it has, a, it has a, an appeal uh, that we're going to somehow have a wall that will guard us. Uh, the same is true in the Brexit thing, that somehow the English Channel is not channel enough. It's not doing enough <laughs> channel work to keep whatever it is that Britain needs to have to know that it's so. Um, I mean, the problem of this is it's, it's literalized. That is, the, the need for, there is, a, there is, somehow these elections indicate that there is a need for some kind of defining boundaries, that we've lost something important. And the problem is that what's happened is it's been literalized. We're going to keep the Pakistanis out, or we're going to keep the Mexicans out, and we're going to build an actual brick wall. Um, and also, it's been, it has no play, you, you know, what it does is to, is to settle on um, ethnic and religious and racial difference as the way to think of these walls. And, and that is not the way to go. I mean, that, uh, I mean part of Mr. Trump's skill is to, is to, is to start fights. And uh, if these fights end up being around ethnicity and religion, so you know, there's something going on there that I think is usefully thought about in terms of this, these old stories. But uh, the, the complete lack of humor and um, I mean, I'll tell you some boundaries that are important uh, in my uh, country. The division between church and state. That's an incredible invention that came out of the Enlightenment and was the end of religious wars in countries that have managed to separate the church and the state. Or in my country, I mean, just yesterday, Mr. Trump fired the head of the FBI because the FBI is beginning to investigate his connections to Russia. 
And um, we have a tripartite system. We have a division between the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. And if the judiciary and the, exec and the legislature do not re uh, protest this, uh, this firing, then the division between them are lost. So we need judges who will say, you know, we need law enforcement people who will say this is the wrong thing to do, and we need the Congress to say this is wrong. But, you know, if, if his skill is to erase things like the division between church and state and the division between the three parts of our government, then we're talking Ragnarok here. We're talking, you know, a kind of really destructive uh, taking apart of the system. And it doesn't have that artistic impulse that I mentioned in, in uh, Maxine Hong Kingston. Uh, the, the Kingston realizes that if you're taking something apart, you've got to have something to replace it. You've got to have something more beautiful that works in the current world uh, if the old world is not working. And Trump has no vision about that at all. It's entirely about um, starting fights. Mm -hmm. so, and, and finally, the final thing is to say is all the old wisdom is that this character belongs at the margin. Uh, he's the last born of the gods. He's at the edge of the city. You do not put him in the middle of your system. If you did that, it, it's, you'll destroy the system. Mm. I've got one final tale. Let's have one final tale. Oh, we've got a question that has a burning question. OK, burning question. Um, it's for both of you. And I wondered what, you told a lot of stories about men, which yeah. is amazing. But I wondered about the role of the female. Well, here we go. This is it. This is the tale. Well, I'll just say quickly, yeah. if, this, is, this is an important question. I have an appendix in my book that, that is my response to it. Um, uh, <laughs> well, because when, when, I was working on the, when I was working on this book, the, the canonical tricksters in, in, in the literature are, are mostly men. There are women tricksters. Um, but you know, one has to explain why this is. And, uh, I end up just briefly with three answers. I mean, one is that maybe this is because these are, the, all these stories come out of patriarchal cultures, and we need to look for, uh, you know, the, there must be another set of stories which, I, which were not present at the time I wrote this. Um, and in fact, I have one. In the Greek system, there's a, there's a character named Baobo who, uh, she's like the female flasher. Yeah. When, when uh, Demeter is depressed because Persephone has been stolen, uh, Balbo exposes her genitals and it makes Demeter laugh, and it's the beginning. And it's, it's exactly the kind of thing that is in these trickster stories, and it's a female. But you can see, um, I actually quote one of the church fathers from the 12th century saying, well, I'm going to tell this story, but there's some part of it I'm just going to have to not tell. So you see the men erasing the, the female character there. And then finally, maybe some of this material is about differences between men and women. And in fact, uh, there, there are female tricksters in the, in the Native American situation, but they differ from the male tricksters in a couple of different ways. Um, in particular, the, the sexuality is different because the consequences of uh, kind of on their own sex are different for men and for women. So the, the stories are distinct. Um, and if you want more, it's, I got some pages about it. He does. And uh, he has a story. I have a story. And also anybody that's, you know, I'm not going to tell it tonight because so many of you will have already heard it verbatim from me. But it's, it's the story of Lady Ragnell. If you really want to look at a voracious, uh, ingenious, troublesome, brilliant being from these, look at the story, you know, the marriage of Lady Ragnell. And they're called loathly lady stories. Loathly lady stories, medieval tales. They're wild and they're... Yeah, absolutely shameless. So I want to finish with a Siberian story. And it's up to you to find out where the trickster is in it. Or whether, as Lewis has said earlier on, the story itself may be the trickster. And in its traditional setting, this is sometimes told uh, to young women uh, when the older ones have looked at them and they've said, you see how she moves her head in that certain way, we recognize uh, she has some kind of old thing in her. The old owl that lives in her face is moving forward. She's becoming shaman. So this is that story and this is where we will finish. There was a great forest, 
And next to the great forest, there was a little hut. And living in the hut, there was a man and a woman. And the man, he was a hunter. And he was married to the woman. Now, if I'm going to tell you about the man, I have to say, he was astonishingly ugly. But if you spoke to his wife, she would say, I can live with his ugliness. If I'm going to tell you about the man, I have to tell you, he had only one baleful, bloodshot eye. But yet again, his wife would have said, I can live with the one eye. But the thing she couldn't live with, the thing that stuck in her craw about her husband was this. It was his secrecy. He would leave the house at dawn and not come back till dusk and not say a damn thing about what had transpired all day in the forest. There are many men like this. So let's get this straight. She has an ugly, one-eyed, secretive husband. I don't know if this is ringing any bells at all. So she decides one day, you know, I'm going to follow him into the deep forest and see just what it is he's up to. So that night she gets into bed and she's, uh, she's in all her jumpers and her clothes, everything to keep her warm the next day. And he shuffles into his side of the bed. It's a sad thing she knows that his hands will not reach for her in the dark. All her clothes and the flesh underneath he will not discover now. So dawn comes, he leaves the hut and she trails behind him. I mean, you know, she can't check his emails, she can't check his phone, nothing. She's just got to follow him into the forest. And here's the thing. Every step he took further into the forest, his mood seemed to lighten. Every step he took far away from the house, every now and then there was a little jump in the air. He was humming a jaunty tune under his breath. Those that were there insist by the time he was fully submerged in the forest, he was doing a little Irish jig. River dance had nothing on her secretive, ugly, one-eyed husband. Now, this is a revelation to this woman. She's thinking, he is carrying all this eros and all this joy, and he has kept me deprived of it all these years. Better keep on his trail. And now he's singing, and he's, he has a gorgeous, sonorous voice. She's never heard him sing before. So he comes to a meadow in the forest, and the sun comes out. He raises his arms in the air, and he starts to sing so beautifully it was as if a thousand candles were lit in her heart. And as she watched him singing his glorious song, she saw him begin to change right there. He began to shapeshift. And in front of her, he turned from a secretive, ugly, one-eyed husband into an even uglier, secretive, one-eyed husband. If he looked bad before, he was positively terrible now. There were tusks erupting from the jaw of his mouth, hair bursting from places I can't even possibly mention, little jags of lightning. His breath was like Brixham Harbour at low tide. And now his little dance has gone into a kind of devilish flamenco. This is what we get up to when men are left alone in the forest. We sing our macabre and crazy little songs to make the sun come up. But it was one of those moments, you've had moments like this, and you said, my God, he is worse than anything I ever expected. I am not going to go back to the hut. I am not going to be the, husband, uh, the wife of this revolting little man anymore. I'm going to move to the South Hams, I'm going to individuate, and I'm going to get out of this situation. <laughs> So she runs, she runs, she runs further into the forest than she's ever been before. She's not on a path anymore. She's just moving through the, the thistles and all the, uh, the understory of the forest. But she has that liberation in her heart that means she's about to escape this grotesque situation. And then suddenly from behind a tree, an enormous giant picks her up and says, ha, 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 another one. <laughs> You're as reliable as... Uh, you're as reliable as buses. 
you come along two or three an hour, and now I'm going to take you back to my big black yurt, and tonight I will devour you with a nice Chianti. He does indeed take her back to the black yurt, slings her in, closes the door. We've all lived through this. She's sitting in the dark. She says, look, I've left... I've left my husband, and now I'm in a worse situation than before. The self-help books told me nothing about this. Nobody told me about the giant in the forest. And she is sitting there on the floor feeling utterly miserable. When out of nowhere comes a small, quiet voice, and it's very simple, it says this. Become raven. Become raven. And she looks up. And hanging from the ribs of the tent, she sees there are many different animal hides. And sure enough, up there is the pelt of a raven, or not the pelt, but like the wings of a raven, like a cape. So she thinks, well, it's the still small voice. This is my John of the Cross moment. I'm going to pull it down. I mean, it's all you've got to go on. And do you know what? It didn't fit your still inner voice is lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> Bugger! I can't even trust that, it doesn't fit. Now as she's sitting there bemoaning this horrible situation, she glances up again, and in the half light of the tent, she can see there's another pelt. Now this pelt clearly is the pelt of a fox. It has that wonderful red, that kind of glimmer to it. And she abandons the raven dress. She pulls down the fox pelt, puts it on and it fits so beautifully. And immediately, you know, her senses, her nose, her nostril flares. And she can smell so acutely in a way she never could before. She immediately realizes that the way out of the tent is not the lofty way up, but the way down. Because the breeze is coming from the bottom of the tent. All tent dwellers know this. So she gets down on all fours, she starts to snuffle, and within a couple of minutes, she has moved enough soil out of the way that she has crawled out from underneath the tent, is back out in the forest, and is free again. Now, she is a woman of resolve, and she has no intention of going back to that uh, hut with her husband in it. But she has to get back to the village she grew up in. Surely she has to see her mother and father. So she turns and she runs and she runs and she runs until she comes to the village. Now you should know that next to the village is a great lake. And she thinks, I'm so thirsty, I'll just have a drink of water before I meet my parents and tell them what's happened. It is only then when she is peering down in her reflection in the deep waters, she sees that she is no longer a woman with the pelt of a fox. She is a fox. I mean, she, she's a fox. The very moment she realizes this, this boundary has been crossed, her father, who is out on his canoe fishing, gazes onto the beach and says, there's a fox. I have to kill that fox. There's just too much livestock around here. We can't suffer a fox to live. So he brings his canoe in. He pads down the beach towards the fox. He has his net in one hand and he has his salmon in the other. And she's looking at him with real love. It's her dad. She loves her dad. And she's looking at him, pleading, Father, you've got to recognize me. I'm your daughter. But he sees a fox. A fox with strange, tender eyes, but it's still a fox. So he waggles the salmon in front of her. She lurches forward. He tries to get her with the net. He moves forward with the salmon, tries with the net. All afternoon, this dance went on between father and daughter. And behind him, stands father after father after father after father, and behind her stands daughter after daughter after daughter. And at dusk, what we call here the dimpsy time, some tenderness was moved in the father's heart, and he just gave the salmon to the fox, and he threw down his net, and he went back to his canoe. 
But by now, the village have spotted what is going on with the father and the fox. And torches are being lit, and people are starting to gather. So she turns and she says, I better get back to my mother and father's tent. It's called a Yuranga. And these tents still have a big wooden door, even though the rest of them is felt. So she moves swiftly through the village, so familiar the pathways to her. And she can see home just up ahead. The nostos, the longing for home is in every nerve in her young body. She aims straight for the door, straight for the door, straight for the door, and just as she turns to the door, just as her nose is butting out towards it, the whole tent shifts. And the door frame, the wooden door frame, smacks her face like that. Blood on snow. She turns again. She runs towards the door. Again, the blood. Again, the tent turns. Four times the tent turned. Four times she tried to go home and she could not. And by now, the villagers have gathered. They've got their torches lit. They're trying to drive the fox out. But I have to tell you, the fox did not need driving out at this point. She gathered herself, shook the blood from her muzzle, shot between her mother's legs and her father's and the villagers, and before too long, is far out of that village. She is moving past the copses of trees, through the dark grasses, over the silvery streams and the larch, and to the place where the hills start to grow and become larger hills and become snowy-tipped mountains, and there is the fox woman still running. Above her are a hundred thousand stars, and she runs with that fierce, clear joy you have when you can't go home anymore. And as far as I know, she is running to this day. That's what they tell me. That's what I hear. And that is all I know. <laughs> Thank you.